All right, we're so excited about everything God's doing, and we are delighted to have uh, the senior pastor of the Heart Revolution Church in San Diego, California, with us this morning, uh, this evening, and we are so thankful for uh, everything that God is doing in California. This, there's an extraordinary move of God taking place, and uh, we're, we're happy to be a part of that in some small way. Uh, pastor TJ is a son of this house, and uh, son in the gospel, and so we thank the Lord for his, his willingness to impress in our lives with his gifts and his talents and the word of God given to him. And this weekend, you preached from Matthew, the fifth chapter, yeah. and uh, you provoked us. It was a masterpiece message. It, it was a, a truly an art form. Uh, the way you began to talk to us about the altar of altercation, mm. the reality that all of us are in need of meeting ourselves in the deepest recesses of ourselves and confronting that which is um, perhaps the place of our struggle and, and the place of our uh, vulnerability and the brokenness that we all carry in some dimension of life. And so uh, you began to speak to us about a text, and I wanted to just touch on that and talk about that because this is Father's Day week. Yeah, We're leading into... Uh, a tremendous week where we're celebrating fathers. And frankly, I have a conviction that we have not talked directly to enough men this year because of all of the things we've been going through. But this season has been uh, tremendously hard for men who are the, the, the caretakers and the providers and the stewards and the priests of their home. Uh, so, much, so many pressures have been placed upon them externally that we're seeing... Uh, just how deeply the character of God is working in their life and how God's spirit is undergirding them. And then, of course, in those places where we're vulnerable and broken, we're seeing how the pressure of life is exacerbating that pain. And so I wanted to talk to you for a few moments about what you preached to us Sunday and, uh, and, and delve into perhaps some of those salient points uh, that we need to, to drill down on and get into the subterranean of the theology of. Talk to us about what God has shown you in Matthew 5, 21. And then, of course, uh, you, you leap into Mark 9, and yeah. there's, so many, uh, there's so many jumping off points. But anyway, talk to us about what God is doing through the men of... I've got my men's shirt coming on, right we're, here from we're Heart today. Revolution Church. <laughs> Uh, you have a men's camp coming up this week. Yes, Thursday. Talk to us about what you guys are doing. Our men are anxious to get back together, so talk to us. Yeah, so this, uh, this Thursday, the men, about 200-plus men, are awesome. going to be meeting at a camp. And we're having some of the youth come as well to, you know, yeah. I know often, which is a good thing, we have a youth camp and then... Uh, a men's camp, but sure. to bring the fa the generations together yeah, and yeah. model fathers worship. and sons exactly, exactly. yeah, that's awesome. Um, this week, speaking about altercations, I was reading uh, Matthew chapter five, and um, when it says, uh, "You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill," but when you have anger in your heart, you've done this. Yes, yeah. And so, oftentimes, uh, we keep reading the passage, and then we get to. If you come to the altar with a gift, leave your gift and go be reconciled to your brother. Now, it's, it's important that we don't murder people. Right, right, right. Of course. It's important yeah. that we reconcile with right. people. But I don't think that's the whole point of the passage. Yeah, talk Because to us. often we um, take this checklist of mm -hmm. the Bible and mm -hmm. we try to make a checklist out of it. And we mm -hmm. say, um, thou shalt not murder. Okay, I, I, I didn't murder. Right. And then, no, but you're angry. Yeah. So murder has been conceived in your heart. Right. Uh, I didn't commit adultery, but you looked yeah. in a way. Yeah. And then we get to, to this scripture where it says, if you go to the altar and you remember uh, your brother, go to him. And we're like, okay, we can pull this off. Right. And I, I, I believe this is a passage that's actually revealing to us how the altar confronts us in grace and allows us to see the reality of what we can't fix because we actually broke it. That's right. And we actually need God's grace in that moment. So the whole point is not go fix everything you broke. The whole point is that you broke it and you need to receive oh, yes. reconciliation. Yes. yes, yes, yes. In places that you cannot repair. Absolutely, yourself. absolutely. And 
of course, you know, I'm, uh, part of my uh, theology is uh, leaping into the Old Testament, and mm. you see, <clears throat> you see the fractures and the brokenness of mankind, and uh, it's it's almost by default because of our Adamic nature. It's by default that we we jump into legalism. It's very easy to get into a, a, a to a relationship of ritual yeah. and performance. It's, yeah. it's it's natural for us in our fallen state to want to perform to the feeling of good. Yeah. And and grace is the invitation for us to fall in love with the reality that in our brokenness he loves us. Yeah. In our need he comes and saves us and re- and redeems us. But I think too many men have have become so pressurized in their life that they're they're feeling as if there's no tolerance of grace given to them. Everything is a demand. Everything is a pressure point. Everything is uh, leaning into them and requiring something from them. And they're and they're running around as if they have no more to give. And I think that's been exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, for yeah. for a year and a half that fellowship has been missing. And I'm excited about what you guys are doing this week in reconnecting. I think 200 men, what a mighty army of people coming together with their sons, that generational blessing and and reconnecting around the word of God. What are some of the topics you're going to be, uh, your camp is talking about to these men? Uh, The the, the one from, from me specifically is talking about the spirit of sonship. Okay. And, and, Oh, the, the difference between servants and slaves and, and sons and uh, really being a son of the house and a son of God and walking in, in, in that, that identity. So that would be um, Mark chapter 9, where the demon-possessed young boy, he throws himself on the, on the ground and uh, he had a spirit where he had lost his, mm-hmm. his voice and his hearing and, and um, the religious group was arguing and Jesus says calls them a, a faithless generation talk about that and with that faithless generation then he addresses the father and the father I have faith but help my unbelief mm-hmm. and when you have a faithless generation mm-hmm. you also produce another generation behind you that's tormented oh my that wow. loses their voice right that can't hear the things of the spirit right that seem dead. And, and when Jesus says, hey, these, these don't come out but by prayer and fasting, by an, a, a generation mm. that believes in the next generation, that has faith that God's going to work in that generation. Right. If we don't see the power of God in our kids, right. it's probably because we lack the presence of God Ooh, in our lives. Talk about that now. So faithless fathers produce uh, deaf sons who are, um, how, how did you say that? Who are unable to access the word of life? Yeah, they're, 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 it's a tormented generation. Tormented. A tormented generation who has no identity, have no, no hearing of the things of the Spirit, have no voice. There's a sense of a, a lost generation. Yeah, yeah. But it comes from, you know, we, we often focus on the deliverance. Right. What do we, what's the, once again, what's the checklist of how we get this demon out? Right, 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 right. I don't know if Jesus was talking about how to get the demon out as much as he was trying to get faith so in. So it's, it's our willingness to leap to wanting to treat the symptom. Right. Not addressing the heart issue. Exactly. The faithless generation. Thus, we need a heart revolution. Turning the heart. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to turn the hearts back to the father, uh, the yeah. fathers back to the sons, yeah. the sons back to the fathers. And it, that's, that's, where we, that's where we leap into this reality that we have to confront what's in us as fathers. When, when, when Jesus uh, cast out the demon, it's, it said he, he, the boy looked dead. Mm-hmm. Even when he was delivered, he looked dead. Yes, 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 yes. Talk about that. And then he goes up and he takes him by the hand and he picks him up. Right, right. So it's the, the, a generation of fathers getting in the presence of God mm. through prayer and fasting, mm. coming into the presence of God, getting faith into a, to this next generation <laughs> and taking them by the hand, even when they look dead. That's right. That's right. They're delivered. Yeah. But they look dead. That's right. Wow. But you take them by the hand and, and you, you lift them up. up. That's right. And I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on the, the 
uh, the paradigmic parallel of that is uh, when you think about the reality that a faithless father is an absent father because mm. a faithless father has a deaf ear and a dumb tongue. He will not speak the words of life. Wow. He speaks the negativity and the, the resources and the, from the caverns of the damned, right? Mm. He's speaking death into his, to his situation because he is living in a stream of unbelief. So if you have a faithless father, you have a spiritually bastard son mm. yeah. who has no identity in Jesus Christ, yeah. right? So and so, so the absence of a father, he may be present in, in body, but he's absent in leadership. What a challenge we have today to, to rise up. You know, we deal with people every day. And I don't know about you, but I know here we've seen an exponential rise in, in men that are tormented, mm -hmm. men that are under pressure, <clears throat> and men that are defaulting under that pressure. Yeah. So marriages are crumbling. Uh, relationships are strained. And, and, uh, and I, f I find it uh, alarming to me that uh, the relationships between husbands and wives are so strained that husbands are no longer uh, vulnerable in front of their wives. Yeah. They're no longer able to, to commit to their wife the trust of their fantasies and their dreams. Yeah. Uh, w what would happen if men were able to be open and vulnerable with their spouse and say, I'm not looking at you as someone who's putting pressure on me. I'm looking at you as my partner to walk with me. Wow. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so we, that, that's the healing virtue of God in the home in this season. And there's, there's nothing like a strong father and a strong mother leading strong children to the altar of, of Jesus Christ. And so I think your word to us Sunday was revelation in the fact that it was a confrontation. It was a very sweet confrontation with the fact that we all have brokenness in our life. Yeah. And our ultimate reality is that we lean into Jesus Christ to heal us. We cannot fix ourselves. Yeah, be becoming vulnerable in the presence of God. Talk so about So we can be vulnerable in the presence of others. Talk about that. Uh, actually, I got a, more of a question for you. Okay. Um, my son, yeah. the, the old one, he's 14. Yeah. So what, I, what I've been doing a lot is being extra affectionate, hugging him, holding yes, him, yes, yes. those things. But I, I see his reaction right. as any teenage boy would. Yeah. Hey, get off me. What are you doing? You yeah, know? yeah. Um, but then I, I noticed that same teenage boy that can't take a hug also grows up. And that teenage boy still lives in that 40, 50 year old that's man. Right. That's right. That doesn't know how to receive affection. Well, let's talk about that because that's very provocative. Um, every child that is, that is maturing and going through the stages of adolescence always wants to distance themselves from affection because they think that's elemental and childish. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, it's because of all the metabolic, metabolic structures that are changing. The, the thing we do as fathers is we still encroach upon that and we still hug and, and become affectionate because at the end of the day, what they're silently longing for is the security that their fathers are holding on to them. And too many of the men today are, uh, have been convinced through psychology that their job is to become their child's friend. Mm. It's, you're not called to be your child's friend. You're called to be your child's parent father. And there's no greater joy in a father's heart than to have his son or daughter feel secure in his love. Uh, I weep at, uh, at the testimonials that I personally have dealt with of children who have, ha, who have been uh, victim of an absentee father or even worse, have been abused by a father. And so their whole concept is skewed about what a father is and how a father should love. And so while it may be um, disquieting and not comfortable and, and some, somewhat um, off-putting to a child to have his father loving on him, um, I, I would encourage men to become more affectionate. Yeah. You know, it's easy for me. In fact, I came to Heart Revolution a few weeks ago, and I could walk through the room 
any room that I'm in, and I can instantly discern those who are affectionate and who are not, yeah. who are comfortable uh, being affectionate and who are not. And that's not an indictment against them. It says something about the way the environment in which they grew up. Yeah. And you're, you're exactly right. Wherever you stopped receiving affection, you stopped receiving validation. And where you stop receiving validation, you get stuck in your age. Wow. So that's why you have so Jesus. many immature men that may be 40 years old in their body, but they think like a 19-year-old. Wow. And they're the kind that's going to buy a Corvette and try to find a girlfriend. Wow. Right? Wow. Because they're still seeking affirmation that was not developed in them by a proper relationship with a father and a mother. Wow. And I know that's very general and, and, and uh, very broad, but that's, no, that's the that's building amazing. blocks. That's the fundamental of having a father confirm you. You can confirm your children. There's nothing like the affirmation of a father, right? And uh, you, you're in my home when you were your son's age, and you, I, I, I tried to do everything I could to affirm you. I've got another uh, young man that grew up in, in our home, and I'm, I've treated him like a son because I can't imagine not having the voice of a father confirm you. It, there's, there's something to be said growing up in an environment where you have a high level of expectation placed over you and you're always reaching up to perform, yeah. but you never receive validation. That creates a chasm in, and, a, and a wounding in the spirit where we transfer that to God and we never feel like we can trust in His grace because we never feel like He fully affirms us because we doubt ourselves. Wow. So that's, a, that's an inner healing that has to take place in our fathers, in our sons, and in everyone. And uh, as a father, some of the things I'm working through is um, when fear drives me, yes. I get harsh. Yes, yes. So you're wanting to affirm, but there's also this fear of if, if this child takes this wrong road, right. he's going to end up homeless. Right. He's going to end up, yeah, you know. Right, right, right. And uh, I'm learning more to this, this is God's child. Well, and that's, that's, I mean, I love this kind of conversation, but the, the thing we have to understand is, it's all right to affirm someone without accepting their sin. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, uh, you can affirm someone. You can love someone. Unconditional love loves you in spite of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, too many people think that if I do anything to affirm my child, I'm validating what's wrong with them. No. You're, you're validating the fact that you love them in spite of their condition or their sin or their nature. This is what Jesus does for us. And we are to reflect that. Yeah. So what, what are we doing with our men coming out of this pandemic? You know, the thing that I'm sensing, and to be real frank with you, uh, I think the tip of the spear for men's ministry right now is the message of what are you doing about combating and confronting uh, Pornography, yeah, uh, the invasion of, uh, of virtual realities into your life. You know, the, the Pandora's box of virtual reality has been opened, and now it's been given a broad brush license that it's okay to access anything because we're in a pandemic, and you're expected to be an online virtual world citizen. And so you can derive joy from that. You can derive entertainment from that. And I fear, uh, and that's the wrong word, but I'm cautious about the, the, uh, the subterranean psychology that's being formed and fabricated out of this present danger, if you will, yeah. that gives license to men to think, I can also run into a virtual reality and, and access an image that won't reject me. Yeah. Because they're feeling so vulnerable and broken, but yet they cannot approach their spouse or they cannot talk to their, to, their, to their loved one about how they're feeling about their dreams because their dreams have been shattered. Yes. Their jobs are on, on edge. You know, their, their employment may be suspect and they, they may be under all types of pressure and they don't want to take that home. So what are they doing? Where are they going and recessing? Uh, pa Pastor Richard preached this Sunday. He just wrote a book. I'll give him a little plug. Yes, yes. Richard oh, Delamore. I'm so excited about them. A call to purity. So 
he was talking about you know pornography and things like that. Um, but me, me and JJ were talking about that, and I was just discussing with him um, what that does to your mind. Talk about it. You can almost tell who watches pornography because of the way people use their language. That's right. And they can't sense boundaries. That's right. So they say things that are inappropriate, yeah. but they don't even know it's inappropriate because their mind has been so inundated right. with things that they've created a new normal. That's right. That's not normal. That's right. That's and, right. And so that's where... And, don't you, and that's what I was trying to say, and you're saying it much better than I did, but that's what I'm trying to say about this pandemic because it's erased norms. Yeah. And we are, everybody's we're creating hearing, oh, new. We're, we're in a new normal. We're, what's the new normal? Everything's in a new normal. Yeah. And it's given permission for uh, some people to think it's okay to change your language. It's okay to change your boundaries. It's okay to not have boundaries. Yeah. And so I'm very, very excited about Rich, uh, Richard and, and Brittany's uh, ministry because it is a call to purity. It is a call to come back to the altar of holiness and yes. say, God, purify my mind, purify my, purify my affections. And I think there has to be a, a license given to men to run back into their homes and embrace their wives and stop looking at them as if they're a silent partner and start looking at them as if they're an affectionate partner. And our wives should be confronting the needs of our men and validating. Yeah. And I don't know if this is true. Yeah. I'm learning. Yeah. But you can't do that unless you can weep in front of your wife. Talk about that. I didn't know that till recently. Yes. So my, my grandma passed. I worked on you. <laughs> you, were, you were teaching me, but it wasn't clicking. <laughs> but pain has a way of bringing that out, doesn't yes. it? Yes. So my grandmother, she passed away. Yeah. And, um, and for some reason, my, my mind has a way of escaping pain. Yes, yes, yes. Well, what, is, what you've been through. Yes. So, so I'm like, um, you know, she's older. It's, it's her time. Yeah. This is what's supposed to happen. So yeah. I logically figured it out. Yeah. I almost, um, by minimizing my own pain, I shoved it away in a closet. That's right. And so then people would come to me, hey, how you doing? Yeah. And you divided the cerebral process yes. from the emotional pain. Yes. And that's the most dangerous thing you can do. So what happened when people said, how are you doing? I would, in my mind, say, I'm doing great. But they would poke the pain. Yes, yes, yes. And then I would have to stuff it down further. Yes. Because I wasn't in a safe environment. Yes. So yes. when I went home that night, um, I was no longer in control because I had stuffed so much That's right. that it erupted. And you, I, I could have swore I was a five-year-old kid that just wept. But my wife just being there, like just... Instantly that, ministered to you. I love her more yes. than I thought I could. Yes. Because I've never wept in front of somebody like that. That's right. That's right. And isn't that, isn't that a beautiful place to be? It's that that kind of relationship is so pure and so intimate yeah. and so gracious because she's met you in your most vulnerable place. Yes. And going back to what you were talking about, men that try to be tough are, are, um, are challenging to me because I, I think there's, there's a certain level of cowardice. Or uh, not, maybe not even tough, safe. Safe, yeah. But they want to they split like the atom. They want to divide the cerebral from the emotional yeah. and the experiential. And what happens is they press it down, like you're talking about, they try to contain it within their heart, but unrequited pain, un when you do not deal with your pain and you don't confront it at an altar yeah. of brokenness, it becomes rage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's going to manifest in some behavior. Yeah. And so uh, bitterness, pain, anger, rage, all of these things, wrath, uh, and it hardens the heart. It calluses the heart. So men subconsciously say, I don't want to hurt like that anymore. Yeah. You take a man that's been through a divorce. He can harden and callous his heart and determine, I'm not going to ever become that vulnerable and, and I'm not going to meet that kind of pain again. And he'll never have another relationship yeah. that is open and honest. Because what he learned, what he coped with in this season doesn't let him thrive in the next one. There you go.
It holds him hostage. It holds him hostage. It and claims but, him as a prisoner. But it was claimed as strength. Yes. It's how I made it through. Yes, yes. But in this season, you become a prisoner. You become it. a prisoner. Yeah. So God loves us when we bow before him and break open before him. That's what David, I mean, look at David was a cataclysmic failure. Yeah. He was a moral wreck. And he, he continues to assail the altar. He continues to fall on the mercy of God. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I just committed murder. Oh, God, I just, committed, alone, <laughs> I just committed adultery. I, I've done all of these things. And he just keeps coming back and running to the grace of God. When under the law, he did not have license to a generation of grace. Mm -hmm. He pried open a dispensation that was not open to him wow. with his worship. Wow. With his constant coming back in brokenness and saying, God, it's me. Don't judge the people. Judge me. Wow. Your mercies and your judgments are right. See my sin. Judge me as you will. He had complete confidence in the mercy of God. And so God said, that's what I love. That's, that's what I'm after. And if we could get uh, our men, if we could get our men to be unashamed of the tears that they pray and they speak, you know, I love your your men, and, and I just my heart re rejoices every time I think about being with you guys. A few weeks ago, uh, I, I was I was speaking, and uh, you were down in Tijuana at your other campus. But there was a there was an, a gentleman, and he probably was just a few years younger than I. But he ran up the center aisle, and, and the place broke open, and people started flooding the altar. And I think that's the first time you had an altar call in a while from the yeah. restrictions that you've been under. But the altar filled up because one man made a move. Yeah. And the same, service, uh, the same thing happened in the second service, in the third service. People just running into the presence of God. And it's all because men were leading that charge. And then you had an army of people working in the altars and they were weeping and they were crying and they were ministering. There's something about seeing a man of God that won't hide in an office and won't use calculus and, and get all rhythmic in the mechanics of ministry, yeah. but a man that will stand and weep with you in the altar and pray over people. That's a powerful testimony, and that's what's going on at the Heart Revolution, and that's what's going on at the Church of Champions. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, with, with, with men, th this is one of the things that, that I've been saying is a lot of times we focus on the absence of a father. Yes. But one of the other issues is the presence of a father with absent values. Woo! Talk about that. My God. So you almost rather them be absent if they don't have the right values That's to right. model. That's right. That's right. Um, and, and no discredit to my dad, but he, he wasn't brought up to be affectionate. Yeah. It's not in my nature. No. No. Naturally to right. be affectionate. Right. And so that's a learned skill. You have to learn that. Exactly. And the, the affirming part, you're, you're amazing at. Yeah. I'm not amazing at. Yeah. I'm learning. It's a yeah. learn yeah. skill. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's something that you, but you've addressed it. Yeah. You see it. The need for it, you, you're going to access it. You've positioned yourself to say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn that, that discipline, if you will. Yeah. And then it becomes nature. It becomes yes. part of you. Uh, there's so many things that we do. You know, when I started out uh, in my teen years and, and early 20s, I was, I was an introvert. People don't believe that, but I was introverted. I, I'm a social introvert. Yeah. When I say that, people laugh. I can, I can walk into a place and be perfectly fine sitting on the back row, not talking to anyone. That's my natural nature. Yeah. But I've learned the discipline of how to come out of that. And I think men, the most dangerous man in the world is the man who thinks he needs nothing more and will learn nothing more. Mm. The man who is satisfied with where he's at and he requires nothing else in his life, is the most dangerous man in the world because he has nothing in his future to give. You have to be a student. You have to constantly go to the mirror of your soul and say, Lord, show me what you want from me today that I can learn to be more about you. What can I give you in praise and adoration that will change my character, my nature, my personality? How can I reflect you more? Yeah. How can I be your testimony? And so... I think that's what I love about you. You're always learning. 
you're a, you're an you're an you have an insatiable appetite to learn and develop, and you've from never anyone. arrived from anyone. Yeah, for, you've never arrived, and I think that's what happens with our men that are are great men. They're people that are always learning from everybody. Yeah, I learn more today from kids yeah. than than perhaps I do from some older people because there's so much to learn from them. Yeah, how they communicate their value systems and so forth and so on. So let's go back and touch on this real quickly. What, is, what does it look like for our fathers, for a generation of fathers that are coming up? They're young fathers, but they've never had a father. Yeah. And they're learning how to be a father. Uh, what, what advice would you give them? What counsel would you extend to them about some um, incremental changes they can make that would revolutionize their life well, with their children one of the things that, or their wife? One of the things I'm even teaching my son is mastering the season you're in, becoming yes. a student of the yes. season you're in. Yeah. So when I went through grief, I got every grief book. I grieved. I read every grief scripture I could find, everything about sorrow that I could find. You didn't I, hide from it. I embraced it. I, I leaned into it. Okay. Um, what season are you in? And yeah. if you're entering a, a fathering season. Yeah. Get around other fathers. Yes. Who's, who's been their grandfathers. Yes. Uh, and, and, and find mentors. And don't, don't, don't just go to one, one man. Yeah. God has a, an assignment for you, but surround yourself with wise, godly, godly counsel. Man. Yes. Get some great father uh, books. Yeah. Uh, read every scripture you can find yeah. on fathers and how parenting was done and what Jesus thinks about children. How, how did Jesus treat his children? How That's does right. God treat his children? That's right. And um, so, so for me, it's, and, and my kids are all developmental, different ages. Yes. So I'm new to the, the teenage world. Yeah. So yeah. right now I'm fully embraced yeah. of learning in this yeah. season of what it means to be a father to a 14-year-old because it's not the same kid it was when he was five. That's right. That's right. JJ is coming up. He's going to be a little entrepreneur. Yeah. And uh and, and he's got an extensive mind for, for business. And you have, to, you have to see that and begin to channel that. I'm, I know that we're uh, closing in on time, but I think one of the fabulous things about the Heart Revolution family is the reality that their mission statement uh, and what you're putting in them is the reality that uh, the key to revival, the key to tremendous church growth and changing culture is literally the heart of the father. Yeah. You know, so much is said about the prodigal being down in Egypt, yeah. being a long way from home, wasting away all that was given to him. And the focus is on the recovery of the prodigal. Yeah. When in reality, the prodigal could not come home until the father's heart had turned yeah. and said, I'm going to do something so revolutionary that my older son will misunderstand it. So my good. nature my personality is going to change. I was punitive. I would have punished him for wasting my resources. But now I'm going to throw a party and, re and I'm going to celebrate him coming home. That was a change in the father. Yes. And that change in the father had to take place before it was safe for that prodigal to return. Yes. I have so many testimonies of men. I have a man today that, that I love and uh, he was once a member of this church, but He's buried two of his sons, and it's so tragic because the story could have been rewritten. The story did not need to be what it was, but there was such hardness and such callousness between father and sons that there, there was no way to bridge that. Those, those children did not know how to come back across the bridge, yeah. and they, they, they became exempted from his love because of their failures right? Yeah. And their proclivity for, for failure. And it was such a disappointment to him. They never thought they could recover his, uh, his, his grace. And so they, they couldn't come home and they had no place to go. Yeah. And both of them are in um, eternity tonight. So I, I want to know what we can do as, as a culture to get our men permission, to give them permission to come to the altar and weep with us. Yeah. Weep over our children, weep over our grandchildren, weep over our cities. You have a mighty man in your church that's leading all of your men's ministries that, that's having prayer at 6 o'clock every Thursday morning, I believe. 5.30, yeah. 5.30. And, 
And that's what it's going to take for the church to break the chains of darkness that um, have so tried to uh, imprison the heart and the mind and the um, nature of a vibrant body of believers. The ecclesia of God can be broken open like an alabaster if the men start weeping. And that's what I love about your, your congregation. That's what I love about our house is we have strong men. When you come here, you're going to see as many men as you see women. A lot of places I go speak, it's predominantly women. Yeah. And uh, we, we thank the Lord for that. Yeah. But the women are carrying the burden of prayer. The women are carrying the burden of ministry. But in the heart revolution, you have an army of, of men. And uh, the Church of Champions does as well. And I know our sister churches in Ypsilanti and um, Ohio and, and uh, Florida do as well. But th there's something to be said about an army of men coming back and having permission to say, you know what, it's time for us to weep again. Yeah. It's time for us to pray again. It's time for us to seek God's face again. And it's time for us to love unequivocally again. If, if he comes in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts, then there's going to be an anti-type to that. That's right. The spirit of Jezebel. Yes. Which is going to want to intimidate, manipulate, and control. So when we come after our children... That's the enemy we're going to face. That's it. Now say that again because that you and I confront that almost on a daily basis. Yes. The spirit of Jezebel. Yeah. Which is gender neutral. Woo! My God. And it wants to take out our children. Yep. And it's always manipulating us. Our tro it wants to manipulate us so that it can, uh, I'll use a, a vernacular, it wants to ding our praise. It wants to change the tenor of our praise. It wants to turn us into a sounding, uh, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It wants to hollow our praise because of the warfare we're involved in. But if men will run into the altar and say, "Without intimidation, I'm not going to be intimidated," yep. uh, that that penetrates the heavens and defeats the enemy. Amen. So we love you guys. We thank God for you at Heart Revolution. We thank the Lord for everything you're doing in Southern California and around the world. Yes. You have missions that you're a part of. We, are, we all have a group missions in South America that we are so thankful for. And we want you to know how much we love you from Houston. And we're excited about everything God is doing. At the Church of Champions, I want to greet you and I want to tell you, listen, let me know where you're watching from tonight. And we want to see you this weekend for a life-changing encounter. And men, I want you to come ready. The, the men in California are going to be having a retreat at Man's Camp. And we're going to have a phenomenal Sunday, Sunday morning, where we're going to celebrate the power of God's anointing on your life in your home. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you this weekend.